diving yeah. into Colorado, you, you already mentioned how the members met each other. I mean, one of them lived in your home. One of them lived down the street. One of them was like a town over. But yeah. how, how did you guys come together as musicians? How did you decide that starting a band might be something that's cool? And and Colorado, how did you come up with the name? It has to be a play on Colorado, but you can dive into that. I mean, I think the most concise way to put it is we all were at a stage in our lives where starting a band where all we did was rehearse for eight hours a night was plausible, doable, and really appealing to all of us. So that's kind of how it happened. We all sort of were at these junctures. Menno had been in a ska band that had broken up called The Delegates. I was in between high school and university and just starting school and not really liking it. And Nick was two or three years out of a four-year engineering program that he was enjoying and doing well, but starting to get, I think, maybe a little bit burnt out. And Nick, Nick is just like a friggin' workaholic. So he would, he would go to class, write papers, take tests, whatever it is that students do, I couldn't even tell you. Uh, and then at night he would come rehearse with us for four five, six, seven, eight hours and then get up and rinse repeat. He's just so he's got boundless energy. So kudos to him for being able to do that. And Dean had graduated high school. He was, his idea was to take some time off and we, and you know, he hadn't signed up for a post-secondary program and we just all were in a similar yet different sort of headspace and physical space that starting the band just kind of felt natural. And the name, I don't know. I, I think, I think this is really typical. It's al almost to the point of it being a cliche, but I don't think it's a great band name. And I think, I think if you're a guy who's in his mid thirties and you think the band name of a band that you started with some friends when you were 18, you think that's, a really cool band name that you thought was good when you were 18, then there's probably a problem, you know? <laughs> um, it, and anyone, right. You hear, you hear it again. It's a cliche. You hear Dave Grohl saying, Oh, Foo Fighters, the dumbest band name ever, blah, blah, blah. Oh, Green Day. What a dumb band name. You know, everybody thinks their own band name is stupid. And I think that it's, it's something that's just a weird thing. Bands are weird. It's a weird thing. And I don't really remember how the name was thought up but by the third or fourth year of the band we had an inkling that oh this is like not a great band name two things about it though firstly it was cool because even early on you know we're out playing shows we're meeting other bands we're trying to get signed to labels that never ended up signing us we're doing all these things that we think bands are supposed to do and that bands do. And somebody would say, Hey, what's your band called? And it might be the promoter or it might be the band we're opening for or whomever. Right. And we say, Oh, our band is called Colorado. And they would say, Oh, Colorado. And we would say, no, Colorado. So it kind of, in a weird way, it sort of forced us or allowed us to say, no, it's called this with an H. And I think that was ultimately a good thing because it sort of forced you and it got really, really tiring, but it forced you to say, no, the band is called this. And it's an H, not a C. And maybe that created some memorability. Maybe that aided people's memory in, in remembering what the band is called because they'd heard it twice rather than once, right? I don't know. That, that's something that's, that's come to mind over the years. The second thing was, right off the bat, it just H-O-L-L-E-R-A-D-O -L -L -E just wasn't anything else on Google, right? That At that point on Google, later on, on Facebook, on Instagram, you know, that wasn't anything else on MySpace, right? So when we started in 2007, when that was relevant. So that I think... Yeah, bands always have a fear of, you know, lawsuits that actually, you know, in a small town in the UK, there's already a band called Colorado, right? It's, yeah. it's, so if you can make up a word, um, there's a better chance that, you know, this brand you're building for a decade that it's not going to be taken away from you, you know, if there's a yeah. lawsuit. Yeah, yeah. And if it's also, un, you know, it's dissimilar to anything else 
that already exists enough, then when somebody's Googling that just phonetically thinking, oh, how is that Ben spelled their name? Even if they misspell it, they're probably going to find you on the internet. I, and again, these are just things that I think maybe helped, but I have no way of verifying that. That's completely anecdotal information and I have no clue. So I've, I've had qu quite a few guests that have said that they, they don't like their own band name. So yeah, and that's the, it, the, right? the standstills, um, the standstills. And there's one other band that they were already, what was it? They were already signed and they already had their band name before they even had the rest of the band members. Oh, it was um, Triumph, the band Triumph. Uh, there was a couple members. They weren't even a band yet, but just like two of the members had a record deal just because they were so talented someone a label signed them so they decided to start a new project so they were called triumph they didn't even have a full band yet and then you know you can't change the name after you have success so it's the same thing with the standstills they were already signed and they're like i don't know if our name's any even though it's a good name <laughs> yeah. so it, it's almost like every band kind of regrets their band name but it, it ends up being about the music anyway so even That's names it. like yeah. you know rainbow butt monkeys or um <laughs> Red Hot Chili Peppers, like all these ridiculous names, it ends up just being something cool. It doesn't really matter what, you know, the band is called. Well, yeah. And I mean, ultimately, it it's just, you know, it's the same sort of thing as people, right? Like I, I f always feel for anyone who's named Karen, because it's like, okay, that's been co-opted as this whole thing. But also, as soon as you get to know somebody named Karen, if they're a cool person, then you completely forget about that in it entirely, right? And it's it's the same sort of thing. It doesn't really matter. Or a restaurant can have a dumb name, and if they make great tacos, you're going to go there to eat tacos. You know, <laughs> like it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Yeah. So I, I remember back when you guys started. So I, I believe you guys formed around 2007. Um, between 2007 2008, you guys released these five demos. So it was demo in a bag. And I actually <laughs> physically remember receiving a CD in a clear bag. Uh, right. So I don't know if that was demo in a bag or if later when you did record in a bag, if those were actually in a physical bag as well. Um, how did the idea of making, you know, five demos and, and the aesthetic of having them in a bag, how did that come about? Well, I think that was all born out of necessity. It was probably Menno's idea that really, that feels like a Menno idea in a good way. And, and I mean, you know, he had so many throughout the entirety of the band he had so, and still in his life, he had and has so many quirky, weird, creative ideas that you go like, I don't think you can do that. Can you do that? Oh, I guess you can do that. Okay, cool. And that, but that was born out of necessity because we were on the road and we needed to put gas in the tank of the van. And we had the recording of two or three songs. Okay, we can't call this an album. We can't even really call this an EP. This is 15 minutes of music. It, not even, it's 12 minutes of music. So what can we call us? Okay, it's a demo. All right, we would buy cd burners from best buy and then we would return them before the 30-day return policy so we'd get our money back right so you could you could get a cd burner for free effectively this is boys and girls this is cheating the system a little bit this is a lesson on cheating the system this is okay. also banned success 101 so i mean at that point in time although now now it's like i don't know if anybody would want to buy a cd at all anyways right I, my laptop that I'm using for this call doesn't even have a CD player in it. My car does, but anyways, so we buy these CD burners and we would burn our demos onto a CD. Okay. What do we have lying around? Oh, or what are cheap sandwich bags? Okay. So we've got a demo. It's not an album. It's not an EP. It's a demo because it's just 12 minutes of music and we got a sandwich bag. We've got a demo in a bag. It's born out of necessity. I think, again, I'm pretty sure it was Menno's idea, but it's something that in hindsight, it was like, okay, if we sell enough of these, we can then put gas in the tank of the van and make it to the next town and play another show where we sell more of these to put gas in the tank of the van to make it to the next show, rinse, repeat. And another thing we would do in the early days was we would go to malls in Canada, in America, and we would have a Discman in the COVID era, this sounds insane. We'd have a discman and a pair of over ear headphones with our demo in a bag in the CD player. 
And we would go up to people and we would literally say, hey, excuse me, do you like rock music? It might be an old person. It might be a young person. Didn't matter what their gender was. We would say that to whomever, right? And if they would say, yeah, we would say, hey, do you want to listen to our band for a second? And if they said, yeah, we put the headphones again in the COVID era, this sounds insane. Put the, the headphones that any number of other people have had on their ears, put them on their ears, press play. Maybe you think, okay, I think this person out of the three songs that are on this demo, I think this is uh, the third song type person. Press play. They listen to it for 30 seconds and they go, yeah, you know, that's okay. Or they go like, oh, this sucks ass. I hate it. Whatever, whatever they say. You then say, okay, we're trying to get to city X. Maybe now we're in Burlington, Ontario. And we'd say, Hey, we're trying to get to Hamilton. And they'd say, well, that's 15 minutes away. So get out of here. Uh, or whatever. I'm, I'm joking, but we'd say, okay, we're currently in whatever mall we are in and we're trying to get into it. We're trying to get to a town that's 200 kilometers. Or if we're in the States, we'd say miles away from here. Would you like to help us out? Would you want to buy a copy of this three song demo that you just listened to 30 seconds of one of the songs? We've got them right here. It's in a Ziploc bag. And we're basically asking for whatever, whatever you are willing to give. You know, we'd say, yeah, you know, four or $5, but if you've got one or two, that's fine. And we literally, like we did this, I don't know how many times, maybe it was five times, maybe it was 500 times. I have no idea, but more than a handful of times we do that in a shopping mall. And maybe you end up with a hundred dollars between the four of us walking all around these malls with headphones and, and disc men, CD players. And then it's like, okay, cool. We can all go to the food court and get a burrito or whatever. And then you can put the rest of the money into the gas tank. And then you're back to square one again. It's and, like fancy busking. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And, and I mean, that was something that funded at least the first handful of really, really scrappy punk rock DIY tours that we did. And that, that was like, you know, I don't, I mean, in a COVID era, you definitely couldn't do that. Uh, people would be like, get away from me. You know, I'm not putting those headphones on my ears. And, and again, there's so, there's so many reasons that I don't think you could do things that way. You know, like you always hear about like Dave Grohl is a perfect example. Okay. I love Nirvana. I'm a big enough fan of the first couple Foo Fighters records Absolutely tragic that Taylor Hawkins died so young. All those things being said, Dave Grohl will often go on these grandstand sort of speeches. And I don't think he's a bad dude. I just think he's a bit old and rich and out of touch. He will go, he will make these grandstand style speeches about, yeah, you just need to get into a garage with your bass and your drums and your guitar, just like Nirvana did. And you can do that and sound like shit and go on tour. And yeah, yeah, you, you can become the biggest band in the world, sort of, yes, kind of, but also not really. Like the idea that, and I think this is, the, this is just true about life in general, the idea that anyone's going to succeed in the exact same way that you did is probably, probably incorrect. You know, I think the idea of if you really want to do something, do it, whether it's you want to write a fantasy novel, do it. You want to paint pictures of your friends that you then sell to them, do it. If you want to start a podcast, do it. If you want to make animated short films and put them on YouTube, do it. The idea of if you want to make art, by all means, make art, make content, fill your fucking boots, man. But the idea that like, oh, listen to me, kids. This is what I did. And it worked out pretty darn well because my band Nirvana did really well. And then I started another band like that seems completely insane to me. And I think it's a matter of, you know, somebody who's 50 and a millionaire is not in any industry. Somebody who's 50 and a millionaire is not going to succeed in the same way that like, who's a modern success story, maybe Billie Eilish, right? Billie Eilish has not succeeded in the same way that Dave Grohl has succeeded. And that's like, both of their success is completely valid. Both of them have made super cool music. And the idea, I think it's important to kind of recognize that, okay, there is an element of right place, right time, but it, there's also an element of, yeah, 
we were doing things that worked at the time that may or may not work now. Anyway, so that's my that's my grandstand speech. That maybe is just as out to lunch as as how I feel every time Dave Grohl is like, yeah, start a band, whatever. And yeah, start a band. By all means, start a band. You know. Yeah, here's here's advice from someone that was in two of the biggest rock bands of all time, who has a net worth of like two hundred and fifty million dollars. But uh, exactly. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> and like, you know, I mean, well, it's it's really cool to study people who have succeeded to that degree. It's really, really cool. You were saying earlier, one of the things that I can't remember whether this is when we'd actually started recording or not. One of the things that all sorts of successful, uber rich, uber successful people have in common is they meditate, they're grateful, they take care of the health of their health. Yeah, that's all awesome. But it's also really cool sometimes to study people who are stable and happy and comfortable and maybe they don't have that absurdly large bank account or live in a mansion. You know, it's also, you don't necessarily have to model your life after the Jeff Bezos's and the Dave Grohl's and the Elon Musk's. Like there's a lot of human beings in this world that have succeeded and achieved their goals to a certain degree. And they're quite frankly, like just fine and happy with that. Yeah, there's different different measures of wealth. It doesn't have to That's just it. be money, right? There's there's yeah. happiness and fulfillment and and love and all those different things. Yeah. Um, when when we when our bands were both playing in Ottawa around 2007 2008, there was a, a new radio station called Live 88.5, and they came yeah. in, and I believe that one of the reasons that they were approved as a radio station is that they were going to dump a bunch of money back into the local music scene. So they created something called the big money shot, which was yeah. basically the biggest battle of the bands like of all time. You, you, yeah. a band could win like $250,000. We were in it. We, we won like one night. So there's all these different stages of it. Yeah, we yeah. only won our first night and we won like $5,000. Like it was, it was amazing. And you guys went on to win uh one of the big money shots which infuses two hundred and fifty thousand dollars into the band so i'm i'm just like almost no band experiences that how how what are the doors that opened up for you um by by winning the big money shot and and in which ways did that that money help you guys in your development i mean we we wasted so much of that money just having an absolutely fun time. And I think providing a, a really insanely fun time for a lot of our friends. And I don't regret that at all because it was the right thing to do by any measure. But one of the things that we did with that money was we bought a van and that was, that was our main van for my oh gosh. Okay. So that's 2009, at least six or seven years. I'd have to go back and check the tape. So they speak to figure out exactly how long we had that band, but we put hundreds of thousands of kilometers on that thing. And of all of the investments, the investments, uh, you know, that we made, I, I say that because it's like, you know, we were dumb kids who had no business managing any form of finances. One of the smartest things we did was we spent a portion of that money on a van that we just rode till its grave. We, I, I mean, I'm probably getting this wrong, but I think we bought it with about 70,000 kilometers on it. And I think we, I think it was between 350 and 400 when it literally died on the side of the road. One of us driving back to our apartments in Toronto when we were living in Toronto at the time in 2016, maybe. It, it rest, might have been rest in peace, our, our wonderful yeah. Colorado van. Yeah. And we literally, I think, I want to say Dean was driving it. I could be wrong. He just like left it there and called everyone and was like, yeah, the van's dead. It's just completely dead. Um, and in terms of the amount of shows played in that van, yeah, oh, geez, it might be a thousand. It's definitely, it's definitely more than a couple hundred. So that was one of the best things that we did. I mean, I took some drum lessons from a guy in Montreal, a guy named Pat Sayers, who was the best drummer I could find. And I, I was, what, or in my early 20s and hadn't taken a drum lesson for a number of years since I was, since I had been 18 or something like that. But man, 
I don't, I, I really think for the most part, we just funneled that money back into the touring machine. You know, we paid ourselves a stipend. That was enough for us to, to rent apartments and, and not work other jobs for, for a period of time. And really it was, you know, just, okay, cool. That's great. Let's keep doing exactly what we're doing. I think at that point I got a cell phone. You know what I mean? Like, I think at that point, Baller. I, yeah, exactly. You know, I, I, at that point I'm in my early twenties and I got a cell phone that I was actually paying the monthly bill and not letting it just lapse. You know, I, I think I had had a cell phone before that and I just forgot or chose not, or didn't have the money to pay the bill until all of a sudden you owe Rogers like $300 and you're 19, which, so it's, you know, it feels like a billion dollars and your credit gets fucked up and whatever. Um, yeah. I remember, okay, cool. I've got a cell phone. I, I can text friends when I'm in their city and say, Hey, I'll put you on the guest list, come to the show or whatever. Um, so that was like life changing in a sense, but really and I think honestly, man, the, the one of the coolest things about our band was we sort of always said, if some money came in or later on, if we got a, a decent festival offer or winning that contest or anything, it was kind of like everyone would sort of look at each other and be like, okay, cool. So this means we can keep doing this fun thing, right? You know, people had some more ambition than that to a, to a certain degree, but really the first and foremost thing was how do we keep doing this thing that's so fun? And as long as we could, as long as we could keep traveling and playing and hanging with each other and making music in the studio, then it, it sort of just felt like that was success in and of itself. I have a quote sent in here from someone that was there on the night that you guys won the big money okay. shot. So yeah. this is from Jen Traplin from Live 88.5 oh, yeah. Radio Personality. Here's what she has to say. She says, here's the thing. I have a terrible memory, like the worst. So if I remember something that happened over a decade ago, it's because it's something that really stood out. Oh. And I specifically have a very vivid Jake Boyd memory dating back to 2009. That's when I first met Jake. His band, Colorado, was competing in and later won the Live 88.5 Big Money Shot. During the competition's finale at what was then the Capitol Music Hall, the crowd was so amped uh, that they started throwing shit on stage. I don't remember what exactly, maybe beach balls. Either way, it was super distracting for the guys on stage who were literally trying to win hundreds of thousands of dollars through, <laughs> through this competition. And I specifically remember Jake addressing the audience at one point saying, word for word, let us do our fucking jobs. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's when I knew he was legit. For as much fun as these guys had as a group, he wasn't just some kid messing around in a band. This was his job, and it's a job that he does extremely well. Add to that the fact that he is just about the nicest guy you'll ever meet. Plus, he loves dogs. That's from Jen oh, Traplin, Live 88.5. That's super nice. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, I definitely don't remember saying that. And hearing that back now, I sort of feel like, oh, man, I, I, that, I feel like I was taking myself a bit too seriously. Do you but, remember stuff getting thrown on stage? Was that a big thing that was happening? Well, there was a period of time that we, you know what, even those beach balls, they might've been ones that we put into the crowd ourselves. So it's like, there's a degree of hypocrisy there, right? <laughs> That's like, oh, here's some fun beach balls. Hey, don't- How no, dare you throw those beach balls? Yeah, yeah, you know, don't have too much fun now, right? Um, I, no, people were- for the most part, we're always pretty cool. We always wanted and encouraged a lot of participation. And I feel like, you know, in hindsight, probably the other guys were like, oh, Jake, fucking relax, you know, <laughs> like, like, oh, dude, whatever. Like, okay, chill. But maybe yeah, they were physically, maybe the, the, if it was beach balls, they're physically getting in between you and your, your kid. I don't know. There's gotta be. A well, there. there were times that one of those would like hit you in the head and just while you're playing it with, it would be a bit distracting, right? Um, if you're if you're messing around and somebody throws a beach ball at your head, it's not really going to be too painful, but it is a bit distracting if you're trying to play a drum set. Um, but yeah, you know, we always we always sort of encourage participation. We had confetti guns that people would shoot off, and we'd often bring friends or 
whomever from the crowd up to shoot off the confetti guns. And we would, you know, bring people up on stage to sing or dance or whatever. Like it, it always, I think it was always a vibe that was more like, we're all doing a thing together rather than, oh, we're the band that's up on a pedestal and you are all the lowly audience and we're going to rock you or whatever. It was more like, hey, we're all going to have a sort of community experience and hopefully we all come away from this feeling a bit better than we felt when it started. R- rumor has it that, you know, at one point when you guys were so broke as a band that um, those confetti machines that the girlfriends of the band members would actually help to kind of sweep it all up and use the the confetti again for future shows. Is that true? Or is that erroneous? That might, that might be true. I mean, there definitely was reuse and there was a lot of, I mean, so many people, I feel like I have a memory, maybe of Menno's dad, Hayo help. I'm sure at some point he helped sweep up confetti, you know, and, and that was the thing is that, so much about our band was so many people involved that helped to make it a thing. You know, even to the extent that I want to, my brain is like, come on, list off some people. But it's like, I almost don't want to out of fear of forgetting someone. And, you know, or again, as Jen Traplin was saying, the idea of misremembering. But really, if anyone ever so much as even thought about coming to a show, we were grateful for them, right? Uh, It it really always felt like this thing that, and maybe part of it is I was, I was the drummer in the band, but it all, it always kind of felt like this thing that it was like, wow, I'm, I'm part of a thing that a lot of people are part of and, and not in a, not, not in a negative way at all, in a way that's like, this is a community of individuals that are all kind of like, making a thing happen that I hope on, on good days was making everybody's lives better. <laughs>